Um, this, will, this will hopefully uh, convince you that rubrics are a valuable tool for um, for teaching and uh, helpful in improving the effectiveness of our assessment. So this is an um, introductory session on rubrics where we'll talk about the types of rubrics and how to go about creating rubrics. So specifically, we need to focus on two things, the criteria that we're assessing uh, in rubrics and then uh, levels of mastery, which is basically, are you, are you doing something well? Are you doing something okay? Um, or uh, what room for improvement is there, right? So there's different levels of uh, mastery. So we'll, we'll talk about um, how to do that with some examples. I'm hoping that there are going, there's going to be some time left at the end to have a conversation about examples from your classes. So I I, uh, I I trust your teaching courses where assessment is involved. And so I would encourage you, even as we're working through this session, to think of some examples of um, of assignments or, or assessments that you could, where you could use um, rubrics. And then hopefully we'll have opportunity to, uh, to talk about those. So as was mentioned, I'm in religious studies. I'm firmly rooted in the humanities and you'll see that in the, the examples that I uh, that I can offer but I did uh, I did try to uh, remember that there's a lot of uh, esteemed colleagues here in uh, social sciences uh, natural sciences mathematics all that so I, I'm convinced that rubrics is something that we should be using across a lot of our courses and in in a lot of different ways within our courses and and so my, my big goal here is to um, <laughs> to convince you uh, to, uh, to try that and, and, and uh, to consider whether we can increase the uh, effectiveness of our assessment that way. So rubrics are assessment guides, uh, okay. defining criteria and expectations for students and instructors. Um, so the last part for students and instructors is, is the one that's perhaps most important to me. Uh, we, we'll find that rubrics are actually useful for both sides. So for students, they're helpful. When we're transparent about rubrics, it helps the students to know what to expect and how to prepare an assignment. Uh, and then for us instructors, it helps us to be transparent with our grading to be consistent. And we'll talk about how that, how that is so. Here's a, an example of a rubric uh, that I've used for assessing coffee shops in Lahore. Uh, so this is what we would call an analytic rubric. So we'll talk uh, in a moment about different types of rubrics. An analytic rubric is one that is like a table. It has rows and columns. And along one axis here uh, along the top, I've got sort of different uh, levels of mastery from one star to five star. And then uh, the on the side, top to bottom, I've got the different criteria that I'm assessing, like the quality of the coffee, the variety that, that a coffee shop is offering, the, the, these kinds of things, right? So we can use the same thing for uh, for our assignments, but there's some other types of rubrics as well um, that uh, that we might use sometimes, as opposed to sort of this this full table that has different uh, different criteria. I want to start by highlighting some advantages of rubrics. Again, this is sort of the, the big goal of the session today is to encourage you to try using rubrics. Uh, I've been teaching at FC College for uh, six years now, and I have found them more and more useful in more and more different situations. So I would recommend making it a goal that every every semester at the start of the semester or, or before the semester, uh, think of one assignment in one of your courses that you could introduce a rubric for, right? If there's some, an assignment where you're not yet using a rubric, what would it look, look like to write a, a rubric for that assignment and, and try to do that? And then at the same time, um, pick one assignment where you already have a rubric and revise that based on past experience. And then with, with, each, with each semester, sort of you're, you're adding rubrics and I, I believe that will add clarity, will add transparency and will help students to um, to receive helpful feedback, useful feedback for uh, for improving. So for instructors, rubrics can save time because 
they simplify the decisions that you have to make when you're assessing something because you have the criteria right in front of you. They reduce uncertainty for the same reason because they, they specify explicit criteria and using rubrics is not always 100% objective, but it's slightly more objective. It adds a little bit of uh, objectivity uh, if you have good, uh, well-defined criteria. Rubrics increase consistency. So this is true uh, within a course, right? To make sure that you're grading every, every student by the same standards. They also increase consistency across time because if you're teaching a, a semester, a course this year that you already taught last year, if you're using the same rubric, that will help you to remain consistent. And then rubrics encourage assessment based on learning outcomes. We'll talk a little bit uh, about why that is. Of course, we here at FC College, we are uh, believers in learning outcomes, starting with the, the goal in mind and, and having learning outcomes that de define the way that our whole courses are structured and rubrics encourage uh, assessment where that, that matches learning outcomes. There's some advantages for students as well. So rubrics help students to understand the expectations. So when there's a rubric, I try to post them either on Moodle or to include it in the syllabus for the course. And that way students can look at the rubric and they see exactly what they are judged on and what things are important for that assignment so they know uh, what to expect and what I, what I expect. Rubrics provide specific feedback uh, because, well, this is especially true for analytic rubrics where we have tables, right? For each of the criteria, they, they tell a student, okay, this was uh, strong, um, strong performance in this criteria and maybe average in another criteria and then improvement is needed in, in, in this criterion, right? And so they provide specific feedback without making that terribly difficult for the instructor. It's relatively efficient to give specific feedback. And then the rubrics document progress. This is especially so when you have assignments that you're reusing throughout the course, right? So maybe a weekly assignment. In some of my courses, I have reading reports where students are reading something and then they have to write a short report, just 100 words uh, on that. And I use a rubric to, to assess that. And then students can track throughout the course, okay, I need to improve here. And then two or three weeks later, they can check whether they improved because I keep reusing the same rubrics. I hear a comment, but I can't quite understand what that was. Was this okay? Maybe just someone's mic. All right. If um if there's any comment, please uh, let me know. I'll try to keep track of the um the comments in, Zoom, in uh, the the chat in the Zoom meeting. All right. Um, advantages for programs. So rubrics help us to. Once again, they, they encourage assessment based on learning outcomes, which is which is important for the program as well, because at a program level, we have some uh, some learning goals. They also ensure a consistency across sections, of course, often when we're teaching the same course, but different instructors, different sections. If you can agree on a rubrics, that will help ensure consistency. They uh, ensure consistency across time. I already mentioned that earlier. And then rubrics may sometimes simplify program assessment because they offer you uh, data, sort of relatively fine-grained data that you could use for uh, an assessment of a program level learning outcome. There's a couple of different types of rubrics. Some are more common than others. Uh, the analytic rubric, I already mentioned the example of, uh, of the coffee shop rubric. And of course, that was a more of a humorous example, but we'll look at some real uh, classroom examples later on. Uh, one that's slightly simpler is the first one on the list here, the holistic rubric. So holistic rubrics, they don't define se separate criteria, but they give an overall assessment. You know, this was strong, this was average, this was uh, poor or in need of improvement or something like that. Um, and we'll have an example of that uh, as well. There are developmental rubrics, uh, this is a subcategory of analytic rubrics. I'm not going to talk about de the developmental rubrics 
uh, for, for two reasons. One, I, I've actually, I don't think I've ever met a person who used them. But the other reason is they require a, um, a theory of development. And so they don't fall under basic rubrics for that reason. They're a little bit more, um, they require a little bit more background. Uh, and then there are single point rubrics, which can be useful for giving uh, succinct feedback on separate criteria without having a full analytic rubric. So I'll show, I'll show examples of most of those. Uh, so this was the coffee uh, coffee shop rubric, which again is more of a humorous example. So we've got our levels across the top and then the criteria down the side. Uh, the um, one way to think about the different types of rubrics is do you want to have one dimension where you have only levels, only different levels and only different criteria? Or do you have both? So if you have a table that has both rows and columns, then you've got a, a full analytic rubric. Uh, whereas if you have only several levels, for example, um, average, above average, excellent, right? Those would be different levels. If you have those, but you don't have separate criteria uh, like thesis, style, uh, citations, bibliography, right? If you don't have those separate criteria, but just one, um, uh, one description for an overall um, level, uh, then that would be a holistic rubric. And then a single point rubric does give you separate criteria, but it doesn't have separate levels. Uh, so that's a little bit easier to see with examples, right? So holistic rubric, this is from a, um, a class in classical Hebrew. So where they have to read sort of an ancient text in a, in a different language, right? So the reading is smooth. Holistic rubric would be sort of a score, 10 out of 10 would be the reading is smooth. Pronunciation is correct. Translation is correct. And then uh, nine out of 10 would be the reading is smooth. Translation is correct, but maybe with some, some uncertainty and, and then sort of it, it goes down. But I'm not separating the different criteria, right? Sort of the reading and the translation and just assessing everything. This can be useful for assessing classwork, right? When you're in a situation where students are doing a lot, right? So uh, in our language classes, for example, in, in Old Testament, um, in, in religious studies. <laughs> Please make sure that you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so if you're, um, if you're in a class where students are giving lots of answers or doing lots of different activities within the class, you kind of have to assess them immediately. Uh, and so their holistic rubric is easy because you, you just have to choose one number uh, and that's it. You don't have to figure out three or four different criteria. Whereas in the analytic rubric like that, it might take a little bit longer, not necessarily much longer, but it might take a little bit longer to assess because you have to come up with, with an assessment for each of the criteria. So for example, here I have style, thesis, structure, and then citations, and there could be any number of criteria here. Uh, and so for each of those, I have to assess something, which means that my feedback is going to be more fine grained. Students will have a clearer idea. Okay, I need to improve this, but I'm already really good at that. Uh, but um, it might be a little bit, a little bit more, uh, more involved. Uh, so this is something that I would use for most of the homework assignments. Um, and then you have a single point rubric. This can be useful sometimes if you want to give verbal feedback, but in a way that's very short, right? So here for a single point rubric, you don't select a level like good or excellent or uh, or needs improvement, but you just write, you, you, you either write something that is good, that meets the requirements uh, or even exceeds the requirements, like here say style, um, Right, this might be a homework assignment. Uh, and then under style in, uh, if it's really good, I might say clean and clear academic English. Uh, whereas if it needs improvement, I'll, I'll put that in the other column on the, on the left. Um, some paragraphs are unclear, for example. So this way I'm forced to write something, which of course takes a little bit more time, but it does. I still don't have to start from scratch, right? If I just have a, a paper that I'm grading and then I'm going to start writing underneath a, a one or two paragraphs of how to improve something, I'm sort of starting from scratch for every student. Whereas here, with the, the advantage of a single point rubric, it just simplifies that process a little bit, gives me the points to comment on, and I can just put some brief notes in the relevant uh, relevant column. So that's that's a place where you could use a single point 
uh, rubric. There's some key questions when we go about designing rubrics, and this is where rubrics connect to learning outcomes. So the first question is always, what are your learning outcomes? Uh, so for um, uh, for us here at FZ College, we like to think in terms of uh, DFINK's uh, approach to course design, where the learning outcomes sort of determine everything in the course. So I'm assuming you already have a syllabus for the class, or at least you've got your learning outcomes as you start working on the, the syllabus and the course design. So you take those learning outcomes for the assessments where you want to use rubrics. What are the learning outcomes relevant for that assessment? And then the next step is what are the tasks that demonstrate these uh, learning outcomes? The nice thing about uh, DFINK's approach is that usually when we write learning outcomes, we already use output verbs, uh, verbs that are sort of closely related to, to tasks. Uh, and so it's usually quite easy to, de to identify some tasks for uh, learning outcomes. And then third, what are the criteria that are relevant for evaluating these tasks? So sometimes for one assignment, you might come up with several tasks. Say it's a written assignment uh, that might include citations and bibliography, then writing the bibliography might be one of your tasks. And then of course, writing a thesis statement um, and, and various other things, uh, interacting with other scholars. You might come up with several tasks and you might have several criteria for a task, or you might just have one criterion. Uh, so when you have several criteria for an assignment, that means you're going to effectively have an analytic rubric. Um, and, and this is usually useful if you have um, a, an assignment of any, any size, right? Um, where students might do well in one area, not do well in other areas. So then you want to have several different criteria to help students identify uh, how to improve. And then the fourth one, and this is usually, in my experience, the most difficult. What are the levels of mastery that are import, uh, appropriate for uh, for these criteria? And here, for every criterion, uh, you're trying to define as well as possible the different uh, levels of how good a student might perform uh, in that task. So we'll the this last one uh, again is is one where, in my experience, some it, it requires perhaps the most work or the most thought. And also, as you're using your rubrics over several semesters, you'll find some room for improvement for uh, revision and refinement here. Uh, so here are some goals when you're thinking about levels of success or levels of mastery. <clears throat> One is aim for clarity and objectivity. This will help you because it makes grading easier and quicker if you have something objective. So there's one rubric I use where um, I sort of count the number of mistakes for a given unit of text. This doesn't work for most assignments, but there, there, there's one assessment where this is possible. I said, okay, no mistakes is sort of the highest level of mastery. If you make one mistake sort of in this space, amount of text, then, uh, you know, that's the next level down. If there's more mistakes than that, um, then th that's more so that, than sort of almost counting mistakes, which is, of course, very objective. Usually you can't be, you can't do quite that, but still try to be clear. Right. So um, you might uh, you might say, OK, this this essay or this uh, this project is interacting critically with secondary sources, right? And that, that's relatively clear, right? I mean, you might want to break it down further than that in some way, what does that mean? But at least, right, if a student is only reciting what other people say and never questioning any of their, their secondary sources, never sort of critiquing another scholar, another author, that's pretty clear they're not interacting critically, whereas then if they are, that's sort of the, the higher level. So try to define that. And this will take some experience of actually using the rubric, um, which is where then our revisions come in. You'll find that, oh, there's certain kinds of mistakes that my students tend to make. Can I can I just mention that in the rubric? Okay, this this kind of a mistake is, is associated with a lower level of, of mastery. And then that makes it easier. Every time you see that mistake, 
you, you sort of automatically can pick that. And also the students will appreciate this because then, okay, I should avoid this because it's mentioned in, in the rubric as being an example of sort of um, below average uh, performance. All right. The, the other thing is use constructive language. This is one that's, that I find slightly difficult because you want to be clear when there's a mistake, you want to say so, but, but try not to be discouraging, right? So um, you might use language like um, the, this, for example, style needs improvement. That's, that's a little bit vague, but um, if you phrase something as needing improvement rather than being bad, um, it's a little bit less discouraging and, and, and sort of opens up the, the, the possibility that students will take it as a challenge to improve. And you want to motivate students to, um, to excel. Uh, here's some examples of learning outcomes you might have. And, and these are things that you could take just from your syllabus. Uh, out of the, the learning outcomes mentioned in your syllabus, which are the ones that are relevant for this assignment where you're writing the rubric, and then just take those learning outcomes, right? For example, identify issues, approaches, and scholars relative to the study, uh, re relevant to the study of historical sociology. So this would be, of course, in terms of the, uh, the um, types of learning, levels of learning, right? This would be knowledge, sort of basic, basic knowledge. But then we have others in the area of integration, um, human dimension, right? The whole sort of breadth of the types of learning that uh, do you think identifies, right? Explain the strengths and limitations of common data structures with, with relevant uh, examples. Um, integrate, right? If you want something about integration, right? Integrate literary and historical analyses in the interpretation of primary sources. Again, I warned you ahead of time, I'm coming from the humanities here, but you would know very well sort of the kinds of learning outcomes that are relevant in your, uh, in your field. Uh, here's an example of a task that might be associated with a learning outcome. So, for example, identify a topic and research question, um, analyze relevant evidence. I, I admit that one's a little bit vague. Um, interact critically with other scholars who have written about the topic. Right. So these uh, these kinds of um, these kinds of things would 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 then be points where you think. The next step, what are, what are the criteria when I evaluate the task? Has somebody interacted critically with other scholars? Uh, what, what might be relevant criteria, right? So are they, um, are they demonstrating critical thinking in their interaction with other scholars? It might be that there's another criterion then. Um, are they citing them correctly? These, these kinds of things that go into academic writing, right? Write clearly and coherently would be, would be another task that you might identify. You, you then have different criteria. These are ones that I sometimes use in, in various rubrics, style, thesis, structure, citations, um, right? So these are the, the different aspects of the assignment that you would assess in your analytic rubric. And then the last part is sort of the most difficult defining levels of, of success where you take each of these criteria. Uh, so for example, you might take style or you might take thesis, which is this, this next example. And then for that criterion, for thesis, what does it mean to do a really good job? What does it mean to do an average job at this? So in this example, I've matched sort of, I've given a description and then a grade, right? So for, uh, for students that score an A it, on this criterion, it means that their thesis is clear, uh, it's significant, and it's supported with sufficient evidence. Right? If it's uh, if it's a B, it might be the thesis clear. More evidence may be needed to support or demonstrate its uh, significance. Now, in this case, I've taken grades A, B, C, D, right? And then, of course, I have if I have three or four criteria, the final grade for the paper is going to be the average of of those criteria, right? If you get an A in three of them and a B in one of them, then you're going to end up maybe at, a, at an A minus or something like that. Or, uh, so, so I average them out. Of course, you might have weight. So you say, well, content is actually more important than style. Uh, and then you you weigh that one more, more uh, highly. Uh, you don't have to pick grades, right? You can use something descriptive instead of having A, B, C, D, which can be sort of a little bit, I don't know, threatening. Uh, you could use just um, excellent very good, good, fair, 
um, needs improvement, right? You can use a more descriptive term instead of a grade. Obviously at the end, uh, at some point you need to convert this to grades because we are required to give grades, uh, but you don't have to define your rubric based on, on grades, but do try to be as transparent as possible uh, because students, they tend to, because of the system we're working in and to sort of the, the, the background of the educational system that they're coming from, they tend to be very motivated by grades or, or, or maybe uh, motivated to avoid bad grades, what, what they perceive as bad grades. So, so try to be transparent, but the grade doesn't have to be defined as part of the rubric. Uh, you might use more, uh, more descriptive language instead of uh, ABC or 1098 or, or, or whatever. Um, there are some next steps that I would recommend um, after designing a rubric. Uh, one is post the rubric on Moodle, or, or you can put the rubric in your syllabus, and then you post the syllabus on Moodle, right? But make sure that the students can find the rubric before they do the exam so that they have some, uh, some clarity. In my experience, some students struggle to work with just a rubric. So if you give them a rubric, even in my mind, this might be clearly defined, right? I tell you exactly what I'm looking for, uh, but the students might still struggle to envision what this looks like. And so in my experience, it can be helpful to also provide a sample answer, right? Here's a model response of what this might look like. Um, and th this, of course, is, is easier to do if it's a short assignment where you can just write something up quickly. Uh, as an example, if it's a complete... Uh, research paper, uh, it might be a little bit more difficult to provide a model, but maybe you might have students from past semesters that are willing to share their, their paper. Um, and then with their, with their permission, you could, you could post that as a sample answer. Um, but post the rubric for, uh, for transparency and then <clears throat> use the rubric when you're scoring the assessment so that you are, um, in case of an analytic rubric or a holistic rubric that sort of defines a level, you look at the rubric and at the assessment and you, you just sort of um, fill in each um, level of mastery. And then you provide the scored rubric to each student, not just the, the, the overall grade, but let them see, okay, I did well in this area, I didn't do so well in the other area, and that will help them and motivate them to improve. Then keep notes for future revision. So very often, rubrics, when we first write them, they are not optimal, right? They might be good rubrics in and of themselves, but then the rubric sort of encounters the, the student work and there might be um, frequent mistakes or a specific kind of mistake that you didn't mention in the rubric. Like, oh, how do I deal with this? Uh, so then you might refi refine your rubric to clarify um, those points. Or you might uh, you might end up realizing that maybe the criteria were not um, the criteria could be improved. I'll give an example of that uh, in a moment. But just keep notes, right? So if you're if you're using the same rubric and again and again, maybe for a weekly home homework assignment like a reading report, then of course you could even revise them during the semester. I just make sure that you post the updated versions so that students are clear that the rubric has uh, been updated. Um, but otherwise, just keep notes for the next semester, and then at the start of the next semester, uh, change the uh, change the rubric to to make it um, more useful for the actual student work that you encountered. And of course, consult with students and colleagues. Obviously, if you're teaching, if you're sharing uh, sections of the same course with other uh, colleagues, make sure, as in so insofar as that's possible, um, you know, try to use consistent rubrics so that students will be graded the same whether uh, they're in one in one section or the other. Also consult with students. So uh, I realize that sometimes when students are commenting on uh, sort of what they find helpful for learning, the answers they give you might be, you know, just motivated by a desire to do less work. But um, but you will find that, 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 that students can comment, okay, I'm not sure, um, I, I don't, um, uh, I don't understand why I'm, why I'm being graded this way, right? And then it might think, may I help you to, Talk about them here. This is this is the rubric that I'm using. This is what you did in your in your uh, in your work, uh, and so according to the rubric, it should be here, right? But maybe the student didn't get that connection, and that might help you to realize. Oh, maybe there's a way I can phrase that differently for more clarity, for example, right? So uh, consult with colleagues and students as you consider continue to 
um, revise and uh, improve your uh, your rubrics. Uh, I want um, my my experience is that um, one of the most uh, significant factors in telling whether students will learn and will improve over the, the, the course of a semester and also through throughout their time in the program, sort of one of the most important factors is whether they have some confidence in the assessment process, right? So if students are uh, getting the impression I'm not being graded fairly or there's favoritism or something like that, they will not be motivated to improve because they will feel, well, whatever effort I put in, I'm just gonna end up with the same grade anyway. And it might be that you are super fair and perfectly consistent right now. Nobody is perfectly consistent, but it might be that, you know, you are as, as consistent as somebody can be, but the students don't realize that they don't understand that. Uh, and, and so whatever transparency you can provide to, to help students to trust the process, to trust your grading and also give them something specific to, to improve. Uh, that can really work wonders, right? And and rubrics are one of those those things where if students understand the rubrics and they understand, okay, this is why I'm graded lower here, even though I tried to improve. Um, if if they understand that and they get the impression it's it's applied consistently and fairly, that will help them to trust you, and that is sort of one of the most important factors in student learning and student uh, student improvement. So. Uh, I I would uh, encourage you to try to use rubrics as a way of making making assessments transparent, um, not just fair. Again, they help with fairness, but theoretically, even if you were perfectly fair already, if the students don't realize how are you being fair, then they won't have that that trust that will help you that will help them to be motivated to um, to improve. All right, I wanted to give an example of uh, revision. So this was a rubric that I designed, I think maybe one or two years ago. <clears throat> and this was for reading reports. Uh, so this was a course where every class session there was a, a reading assignment and they had to write about a hundred words uh, to assess that. And I wrote a rubric and this is a simple rubric, right? It has basically three criteria, content, style, and length. Um, now, one thing that perhaps we haven't talked about enough is just the, 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 the process, right? For you, for us as instructors, we have to, obviously we want to give as, as good feedback as we can, but we also can't create too much work for ourselves because if we're spending too much work grading assignments, we'll have less time for class prep, less time for meeting with students. So somehow we have to find a balance. Um, so here I had just three criteria and the two main criteria were content and style, right? Uh, so the, the third criteria length, it, it only had two things. It was either okay or too long. Uh, and, and if it's too long, I, I subtract a point. And this is just because if there's a class of you know 20 students, this was an MPhil level class. If there's a class of 20 students and everybody writes 500 words for every session, right? I'm going to be drowned in, in, in work. I can't read 500 words for every student, for every class session. Um, I have other things to do, right? So to encourage students to keep them short, I have this criteria, right? Where if, if you write too long, you lose a point, okay? But the, the two main criteria were content and style. And style was okay, but I realized throughout the semester, there's a problem with my criteria for content, right? This is kind of assessing a lot in one criterion. Uh, so for example, um, I wanted to test uh, critical thinking here. Uh, are they contrasting different possible views uh, in this reading report? Uh, and you see that, for the 10 points, right, the higher end of the uh, the levels of mastery contrast different viewpoints with specific details, that's all fine. But then as you go down um, right, to uh, sort of seven, right, I just had represents the author's view accurately, right? Um, which is, okay, at least you've represented them accurately. Maybe you didn't think critically about it, but you just, uh, you summarize it correctly. And then number six misrepresents the author's view, right? So I realized as I was using this rubric, I'm doing too much in one criterion because sometimes you have students that have, you know, they're thinking critically, they're contrasting different views. Maybe they're critiquing one view, um, even in the short space of a hundred words, which is great, but just there's one point where they slightly misrepresent what the author is saying. So then do I choose 10 or do I, do I choose six, right? So because I've got uh, sort of a bit of a tension here within this one rubric, I found it 
quite difficult to, to use in, in some cases. Um, and so I ended up having to revise this. I added a criterion where now I have sort of focus. What is the author? So focus and evaluation are, this is the revised rubric where earlier it was just uh, content. And now I, uh, I, I separate that sort of into what are you focused on? Um, and then to evaluation or sort of critical thinking, are you are you contrasting different different possible views, different possible answers to the research question? Um, this is I don't want to get into too, too detail. I just wanted to show this as an example of where I had to split one criterion into two because otherwise I was being inconsistent. And this is one pressure that we feel sort of when we're using rubrics as we are trying to get more objective and more specific and and improve clarity, right? Often we're saying, oh, well, this criterion, I can really split it out into two different things. Uh, but the problem is, of course, if you keep doing that over several semesters, you end up with five criteria, uh, eight, 10 criteria. So it just becomes a hassle. So then on the other hand, to simplify your work and to keep, keep things manageable, you have to sort of condense the criteria again and, and find a balance somewhere. But this is one thing that as we're re revising rubric, we often find ourselves doing either we we split up criteria into several things to improve uh, clarity or make things more specific, or, or sometimes we just have to keep things simple. Um, so this is something that we have to wrestle with as we're actually using the rubric. It's difficult to know ahead of time uh, how it will it will play out. So for that reason, keep um, keep notes for how you are uh, experiencing your, your, your use of the rubric. And if possible, also on how students are giving you feedback on, you know, is this helpful or um uh, or uh, or not there's one more thing uh, so in a, just a couple of minutes i want to start uh, talking about sort of our our situation have some q a if there's any uh, any questions any maybe uh, input wisdom from from the group i realize that uh, many of you have have been teaching for longer than i have um so uh, but just one final comment uh, based on this example i mean it's slightly clearer in the previous um uh, screenshots. Uh, this is actually using Moodle rubrics. So this is something that I only discovered several years into teaching. Moodle actually allows you to define rubrics for assignments. Uh, and then you can, uh, of course, this will, when you have an assignment on Moodle, you use an activity assignment option uh, in your Moodle course. And then if you define a rubric there, this is under advanced grading. Um, if you define a rubric there, it actually allows you to define the complete rubric in in Moodle that shows it to the students. So it, it helps the aspect of transparency, but it also allows you to just click on these things when you're grading, which is very efficient, right? So for example, when, when you have something that's happening weekly, as the case as was the case with these uh, reading reports, but other also other the other cases where you're using a rubric a lot, you can actually get very efficient when you have this rubric set up on Moodle because it's just three or four clicks, right? You look at the assignments, you click through the different uh, levels and Moodle will automatically do the math for you, calculate the grade, publish the grade to the student. So it, it helps to cut down on your work as you are, um, as, uh, as you are assessing uh, things. There's one more, uh, one more thing that you can use in, in the assignments in particularly in conjunction with Moodle's, uh, with uh, with rubrics, Moodle rubrics, you can um, uh, enable blind grading in Moodle, and then it'll just show you the assignment without the student name. And then um, that's sort of another step where you can help yourself not to be influenced by, you know, the name of the student. Oh, I know the student has always done good work. And then it's difficult to spot the mistakes. Or I know the student has always struggled, but maybe they put in a lot of work this time. And so if uh, if you sort of enable blind grading on Moodle and then combine that with these Moodle rubrics, it can actually um, make the process both efficient and uh, and fair, which is uh, something that I found very helpful. Uh, that's all I have. So at this point, if there's any um, comments, any questions, uh, please, uh, please uh, let me know. Uh, and then we can, we can talk uh, about how this how this plays out in practice, for example, if you have specific uh, assignments that where either you've had good experiences or maybe bad experiences with uh, with using rubrics, I'd be eager to hear uh, that. Thank you very Thank much. You so much, Doctor Deech. So, if you have any questions, please post them in the chat, and I'm also going to start the polling so that you can read the session. Uh, Daniel, I have a yes, sir. Good question. Actually, what about wonderful sessions? 
and I have learned many things which are new to me. Because ideally, I think for each question, there must be a, a rubric which is supposed to be back that question. Because when, when I'm supposed to mark that question, I must know how I'm going to answer. So usually in our classrooms, we have four or five pages mm -hmm. and two or three assignments. One midterm, one mm -hmm. end term, then there is a one project, and one sometimes there is a case and I'll see that. And if it's some guest speaker talk, we are also giving some because the report to the guest speaker session. So if we do that, almost there are the 12 grading instruments. Okay. And for each grading instruments, there are at least two questions. Mm -hmm. So 12 into 2, you can say that, that is me. Mm -hmm. But if I yeah. enter, sometimes there are some other questions mm -hmm. if we are support all the students. And we do all that. It becomes around 30 to 40 rubrics yeah. for one course. And if we have a class size of the Maran teaching student of 39. So 39 multiplied by 40, because when I'm assessing, I have some markings in mm -hmm. my mind. And uh, by checking the numerics, I'm even checking those points and saying this or that. But if you uh, the time to develop the rubrics, 40, and for next semester, again, I am supposed to improve or divide, because I cannot do the same questions. So if the different questions, again, there are the different rubrics. So do you think it, or what is your guidance or mm -hmm. to manage all that? Because it's a team work. Mm -hmm. And if a teacher is teaching team courses in a semester, so you can imagine the volume of the work, just not for assessing the mm -hmm. thing, but also just to develop the rubrics against that. Mm -hmm. Yes, so uh, just to repeat this uh, the, the, this comment, um, so uh, of course we where sometimes we have courses where there's a, a lot of um, a lot of assessments that there might be multiple quizzes. Each quiz quiz has several questions, and then you've got midterms, you've got final exams, you've got projects, uh, and various other things. You might end up with dozens of um, dozens of rubrics if you define rubrics for for each of those. So um, I'm I'm actually eager to hear feedback from other colleagues on that. In my uh, my experience so far, I've I've actually not used rubrics for quizzes. Uh, so I'd be eager to hear what your experience is with that. The, the The issue with quizzes is exactly that you have to rewrite them for every course, uh, and and then if you're rewriting the rubrics as well, it becomes a lot of uh, a lot of work. But maybe maybe it would be helpful uh, to increase fairness. I, I I firmly believe that we need to find balance between sort of um, providing high quality feedback and keeping things manageable for ourselves. Because if we create too, too much work for ourselves, that ultimately will affect student learning negatively, right? It's so, so it's not a selfish thing to, to keep things manageable. But I, I don't have a lot of experience with using uh, rubrics for quizzes. Of course, that multiplies very quickly. So if there's any, any comments from our esteemed colleagues on that, yes, sir. Uh, again. The works are both wonderful. Uh, we see uh, my uh, problem is that uh, uh, one of the reasons why the uh, uh, these rubrics are difficult to handle is uh, already told by Dr. Yas. Second reason, I principally uh, agree, having an engineering background, mm -hmm. that it is almost touching impossible to make it you know, objective. The rubric is just a source of satisfaction for you that you try to make the whole things you know more objective. But at the end of the day, what happens is that students are coming to me and uh, they want more detailed mm -hmm. answers from mm -hmm. me. That why you have yeah. you know, deducted these parts, and I'm happy to give those mm -hmm. answers to them. Yeah. So at the end of the day, that rubric becomes almost redundant for me because uh, they are more satisfied, mm -hmm. happy by my customized and to the point answer. Mm -hmm. As they are not heavy with my generic, you know, rubric things. So I have used these rubrics, uh, you know, a number of times, mm -hmm. and I've always struggled. Okay. So uh, the the so, comment here was. So basically, one line. Of, yep. I actually not able to use. Okay. Okay. So the, the very helpful. We had a. Sorry, we, we had a. We had a. We had a. Uh, Critical take on rubrics here from from our dear colleague. So, uh, w w with the comment that they they are uh, work to produce and they, it does take work to produce and maintain them. 
And sometimes students are not necessarily satisfied and they still come to your office and they still ask. And then when you can answer the, the uh, in your office, that perhaps is, is satisfying to them. They, they understand then why you deducted some marks. So uh, in, in, in my experience, and again, I'm, I'm very eager to hear uh, other takes on this. Uh, in my experience, rubrics still help. So I actually firmly believe that we can, when we use rubrics um, right, or when we use them well, they actually reduce work. Um, and, and so that, that's why also at the beginning, I, I said sort of if I, if I would encourage you to do something, uh, it would be sort of pick one assignment and design a rubric for that for the next semester. And then sort of with each semester you're teaching, you're adding maybe one or two rubrics overall out of all your courses. And then of course you're reusing them. So I wouldn't try to write a rubric for everything just because it's um, it's too difficult to do all at once. Um, but so I, I firmly believe that they can re reduce work, keep, keep things manageable. But I also, in my experience, I have different kinds of students. I do have students who come to my office who want to hear from me, why did you deduct the, these marks or how can I improve? But I also have other students who, who just uh, like to look at the feedback or, uh, or look at the rubric. I firmly believe that rubrics, when we use them, they need to be combined with other forms of feedback. Um, I strongly encourage you, if you've not done yet done the, the, um, the blended course offered by CLT on uh, assessment and feedback, uh, do that. That's incredibly helpful for introducing some of these other ways. So for example, for bigger projects, I like to um, I like to do um, feedback either. Well, um, what I usually do is I sort of do a, a screen capture where on on my computer screen I walk through I talk through the document and say okay this here it, this sentence is unclear or here this paragraph is not structured well you're putting too much into this paragraph here this point you're misrepresenting this other scholar right so I walk them through this through the um, the assignment and then so sort of post that as a video. Uh, on Moodle. Um, but then, of course, other students, they still want to come to your class and to your office hours, and that's helpful. Um, and in fact, for me, that's that's good because it means that if somebody wants more feedback, they can get it, and I don't have to provide everything. Uh, students can still ask afterwards. Yes, sir. Just one more question. We also have a question online. Uh, that's good. And the thing that I do, which is more closer to your uh, you know, model, is that uh, I use an uh, industry based project mm -hmm. uh, for my classes. I teach operations management. So I have developed a 35 point checklist. And against every single point, I have written down marks for them mm. two marks, half marks, mm -hmm. uh, three marks, uh, 2.5 marks, you know, and a total of 20 marks, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, so far, this is more acceptable by the mm -hmm. students. Yeah. I just check uh, the points yep. and how many marks you got mm -hmm. out of these, you know, the detailed checklist. Yep. Yeah, but that is probably like a real version of you can see this uh, rubric. Mm -hmm. Rubric is more generic or mm -hmm. small number. Of so yes, our, our our colleague was mentioning that for some assignments we have a lot of marks and we sort of break down the give individual marks for specific points and and there there, there are certainly assignments where that is uh, more uh, more helpful or more specific compared to using a rubric that might have only five criteria. So uh, so regarding the question in the chat, I'm looking at it. I, I don't actually see uh, the question. Uh, so uh, Ms. Dr. Ramil, yes, uh -huh. Dr. Ramil, John has raised his hand. So Dr. Ramil, if you uh, yes, please, 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 please go ahead. Okay, I am not sure if you can hear me or not because my connection is we, very we can. Okay. Okay, though, I just uh, wanted to make a comment that a couple of days ago, I uh, drafted a, an assignment for my students and it was a uh, kind of a present a presentation based assignment so i just came up with an idea to put the whole assignment on chat gpt and ask it to establish uh, establish a rubric for the assignment so interestingly just uh, uh, sharing my experience that uh, uh, it generated a very uh, well designed framework which i then after reviewing it, customized according to my mindset or the requirements of the students. So one of the tools that we can use to establish uh, basic frameworks for our uh, assignment rubrics is taking help from the chat GPT. That's what I did a couple of days ago. Thank you, sir. So um, I think everyone heard this, the possibility of using chat GPT. So sorry, can I, if I can just come, uh, just, um, just one quick comment that it's important to have a, a good prompt where I think, sir, you were you mentioned you were actually you put the assignment into 
a chat GPT so so perhaps some of that or I, I might even choose to include an example um solution um so so that it's really specific the prompt is really specific and then that could be helpful and then the only other comment in my experience once we have a rubric we need to still revise it uh um so certainly that's a good place to start uh so long as uh, we're not um we're, we're willing to make revisions yes sir Simon, can we assess precisely to the rubrics? Because in Europe, one of the students that work efficiently mm -hmm. and the other was not taking part. Just like the designing a framework and rubrics mm -hmm. for that cycle. Mm -hmm. So I'm just giving the grades or giving my feedback on behalf of all the groups. Mm -hmm. Can we assess the group assignments through rubrics? Yeah, very good question here. Can we assess group assignments through rubrics? Of course, with group assignments, there is the challenge that sometimes one student or, or some students do more work than others. Um, I have not had enough opportunity or maybe I haven't used group assignments enough. My understanding is that there, there are some best practices and solutions to address that. I suspect that... Um, we need more than a, a rubric, but but I I'm not familiar enough. Maybe we could have another session on sort of the mechanics of uh, of encouraging good work in group assessments. I'm not an expert on that. Thank you. Maybe at the advanced level, rubrics workshop would be. Yes, yes, we do have an advanced oh, level. level. That's right, absolutely. This was the the basic level. We do have a, a, an advanced level workshop as well. Yeah. Yes. Actually, I didn't have right yes so there's a question about how to use moodle uh yeah and we're uh, we're running out of time so my answer will not be satisfactory but basically in moodle you would actually define the point system that should be used for your rubric and then moodle will use that point system to calculate a, a grade it's a little bit so uh, you can there's some help on the Google, Moodle help pages if you just Google uh, on Mo Moodle rubrics or Moodle advanced grading. Um, but beyond that, we should probably include a, a workshop on that um, uh, here because it's a little bit tricky to get right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Moodle is quite powerful in this way, but it's a little bit difficult to to get right. So probably that might might require a bit more attention. I'm really sorry. I'm I have to go to class. Yeah. So yeah. I was also going you. to say thank you so much, Doctor Daniel, for this session. This was actually really insightful. If you still have any questions, you can just put them in the chat, and we can get back to them. Thank you so much.